Hey, Anna. Hey, Jeff. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good. I forgot that I had to sign in oh. as, the, as the host. <laughs> I, was like, I was starting to get a little nervous. I'm like, um, it's seven o'clock. Believe me, I was getting a little nervous too. Janine, can you hear us? How is everybody? Good. How you doing? Good. Melissa, Jim, how you doing? Good. <clears throat> Look at Jim outside. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Jim. Mike, can you hear us? Mike from HCAM. Can't hear you, Jim. All right, so I'm not muted. Oh, now we can hear you. Okay. Oh. Man, I still don't know how to sing. But hello, everybody. Hello. Good. How's I it can't going? see anybody. Good. How you doing? Good. Good. Can't see anybody, but hey, there you go. Hey, so how does this work if we want to speak? Hey, Don. Hello. Don. Hey. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. So, what do we do okay. if we want to speak? Raise our hand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you got to raise your hand. So, uh, and then who sees it? Chair or something? I see it. Okay. So my little hand is on. How do I unraise it? I click know. it again, I guess. I, I oh, just it's click gone. It it's, it's gone. It's gone. Yeah. And then, All right. Uh, so, so Don, I'm admitting the uh, public folks that are joining us here. <clears throat> do you want to do um, – the, the public hearings first since we're letting in the public and then we'll do all the business stuff at the end. That'd be better. Keep, I don't know. Yeah. So do we have, who is joining us from parks and rec? Uh, I think Andrew, uh, Andrew Leonard. Yeah. Yeah. That would be his name. Okay. All right. Um, so let's call the meeting to order. Get the show on the road here. I have the script for the remotely conducted open meetings that I have to read. So let me go through that first and then we'll start with the uh, commission agenda. So as a preliminary matter, this is Jeff Barnes, the chair of the Hopkinton Conservation Commission. It's the uh, meeting of the Hopkinton Conservation Commission for May 12th, 2020. Permit me to confirm that all members and persons anticipated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Members, when I call your name, please respond present. Melissa Ricos. Present. Kerry Reed. Jim Cirillo. Present. Ed Harrow. Present. Janine LeBlanc. Present. And Ted Barker Hook. Present. Staff, when I call your name, please respond present as I indicate your name, Don McAdam. Present. Anna Rogers. Present. And Matt Burrell, who I don't think is on the call yet. I don't know, were we expecting him, Don? Uh, yes, yes, Chair, I was expecting Matt Barrell to attend. Okay. Uh, let me see. I don't see him in the waiting room. Um, all right, let me move on. So good evening. This is the open meeting of the Hopkinton Conservation Commission. It's being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. 
In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we are complying with the executive order that suspends the requirement of the open, meet, open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. All members of the public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The executive order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely as long as the public body makes provisions through adequate alternative means to ensure interested members of the public are provided reasonable access to the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting of the Hopkinton Conservation Commission will feature public comment. For this meeting, the Conservation Commission is convening by a Zoom application conference call as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Additionally, the meeting may also be broadcast by HCAM through one or many of its channels or platforms. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that others may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Meeting supporting materials and packets have been provided to members of this body and are available on the town's website via the web meeting calendar unless otherwise noted. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. We are now turning to the first item on the agenda. Before we do so, permit me to cover some ground rules for effective and clear conduct of our business and to ensure accurate meeting minutes. I, the chair, will introduce each speaker on the, agenda, on the agenda. After they conclude their remarks, the chair will invite board members to, pro to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Further, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. And please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, Please wait until the chair yields the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair taking care to identify yourself. After members have spoken, the chair will afford public comment as follows. The chair will ask members of the public who wish to speak to identify their names and addresses. Once the chair has listed as a list of all public commentators, I will call on each by name and afford three minutes for any comments. Finally, each vote taken in this meeting will be by roll call vote. I'll call on each member of the commission. You can state your name and then your vote. All right. So I got a few people in the waiting room. So let me just admit them before we get started. Okay, so uh, let's just jump right into the agenda. Don, as you suggest, we can go over the uh, work session items after we go through the um, public applicants. Uh, so Parks and Rec Department, 66 B Street. This is a request for determination of applicability. It's a continuation. Uh, the the wet, wetland delineation portion of the parcel. And I have to read this before we have our discussion. Locking <coughs> in. Actually, don't, we don't have to read this one. I'm sorry. No. Yeah. Continuation. It's a continuation, right. So, um, Don, who was the representative from Parks and Rec we were expecting? Mr. Leonard? Yes, I believe he's there. 
I'm here. Leonard, you want to give us an overview of the project? Certainly. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. So we are proposing a dog park on about uh, two thirds of an acre uh, on Fruit Street, as uh, off the uh, excuse me, on the access drive to the Fruit Street mm -hmm. soccer fields. Um, as you can see on the plan here that is shown on the screen, uh, the proposed dog park will be located adjacent to the entry drive, um, about 200 yards before you get to the park, existing parking lot for the soccer fields. It is immediately across the access drive from the existing overflow parking area. Uh, Don, could you go back to the site plan? Good yeah, thing. Okay. So uh, this parcel or this portion of the parcel was designated for recreation use on the original master plan for Fruit Street. As part of that uh, master plan that was prepared, there was a proposed con conservation restriction placed on the uh, on portions of the parcel. The heavy dashed line on the plan in front of you represents the conservation restriction. As part of our preparation for the uh, planning of the dog park, we had a wetland survey done. Um, right next to the heavy dashed line, you can see a lighter dashed line and the label buffer zone. That is a 125 foot buffer zone to a potential vernal pool, which is located to the bottom right of your drawing. You can see that the original conservation restriction was very well conceived in that it follows almost exactly the actual surveyed buffer zone as uh, it was uh, surveyed this year, <clears throat> earlier this year. Um, so since we are uh, outside the existing buffer zone, uh, we submitted a request for determination of applicability to the Conservation Commission just to um, have officially uh, confirmed that we are not subject to uh, the mm -hmm. wetland bylaw mm -hmm. because we are outside the buffer zone. Um, Don would be able to uh, read or, or attest to the fact that the town's consultant uh, went out and confirmed the wetland survey boundaries uh, so that they uh, are um, consistent with what our wetland scientists uh, discovered. Um, I'd be glad to go into the nature of the dog park if you feel it's necessary, but it is completely outside the buffer zone and um, we feel is not subject, therefore not subject to the wetland bylaw. Great, thank you, Mr. Leonard. Um, so uh, I concur. Um, I'm not sure if Matt's on the call yet. Matt, are you there? Yeah, I'm on the phone. Okay, great. Um, so, you know, I think Matt, um, you did an on-site inspection um, and you are in agreement that all the work is being conducted outside the buffer zone uh, that's jurisdictional yeah. to the Conservation Commission. And I think your recommendation was just that the uh, applicant install um, uh, a clear indication of where the limits of work are on the site prior to the construction so that we don't um, you know, cross over into the buffer zone. Which we will be happy to do. Okay. All right. Very good. Do we have any questions um, or comments from members of the commission, please? This is pretty straightforward. Uh, are there any questions or comments from the audience? You can raise your hand and I will. Doesn't look like we have any questions from the audience here. Oh, hold on a second. Um, so we have a number 617-529-8262 with the hand raised. Did you have a comment? That's me, Jeff. Oh, okay. I don't have a comment. All right, sorry. Um, okay. I think we're good. It doesn't look like we have any 
members from the public or public uh, participants that have any comments? Let me just scroll through one more time. Um, I think we're good. Okay, so we'll do the vote by roll call and this is to uh, issue a negative determination for the request for determination. Through the chair? Uh, yeah, Don, sorry. Yeah, and it will also be a, it'll be a positive for the delineation of the wetland and obviously a negative for the, for the work because it's outside commission's jurisdiction. Correct, great. Yep, thank, thank you. you. For that. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, Melissa Ricos. Um, aye, in favor. Kerry? I don't think Kerry joined us, so we'll move on to Jim. Cirillo? Jim, are you there? Jim? He's, he's there, he's not answering. Okay, Ed Harrow? Aye. Jim, are you Mr. there? Chairman, yeah, I'm here, aye. Uh, Janine? Aye. Ted? Aye. And this is Jeff and I'm um, an aye. And the motion passes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Leonard. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on. So we're at 158 Hayden Row. This is a request for determination of applicability to raise a garage and build a multifamily house. And I need to read this before we get started. The Hopkins and Conservation Commission will hold the public hearing on Tuesday, May 12, 2020 at seven o'clock PM, virtually online to hear all persons interested in a request for determination of applicability filed by 158 Hayden Row LLC to raise an existing garage structure and construct a multifamily house on the existing foundation with associated site work. The location is 158 Hayden Row, assesses map U23, block 21, lot zero. And Don, were we expecting someone? Um, I think Dan Hunt is, is uh, available. Oh yeah, Mr. Hunt. Yep, I'm here. Good evening, Mr. Hunt. Good evening. Can you hear me? We can, yes. All right. So yeah, this was what I had came in maybe six or seven months ago. Um, and it was asking about before I fill out the paperwork. But um, basically, there's an existing metal garage there that I want to remove and, you know, leave the foundation, leave the pavement. The only thing I would be adding on to it is a deck in the back. And I would get the, um, have them come and drill in the helical you know, piling so that, you know, I don't have to dig it up. Okay. And that's, that's, that's pretty much it. I just, I want to swap that metal garage for a house <clears throat> and leave the foundation. So it's, it's within the same footprint? Yep. Yeah. The footprint would be identical. The foundation would stay. The only thing I would add is that 10 foot deck for egress off the back, but the foundation would remain untouched. Okay, uh, Matt, I'm just looking at your comments here. Um, I think you agreed with the um, resource area boundaries based on your inspection. Yep. Um, I guess you had a question if there was any consideration given to reducing the existing impervious surface areas. Um, and I think I know what Mr. Hunt's response to that is going to be. I think it's a staging area for his vehicles, but I'll, I don't want to speak for the applicant. So, oh, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. So yeah, I would need to keep all the uh, the pavement just for the uh, the board of appeals. You know, I needed two parking spots per uh, apartment, and the way it sits, it I have exactly that. <laughs> okay. Yep. Uh, Matt, did you have any other comments? Um, yeah, there's a couple of things. There, there's a sort of a, a riprap pad um, that extends towards the wetland from the back of the existing garage. Is that going to stay in place or is that going to be removed and revegetated? 
Um, I, I wouldn't mind putting loom over it and growing grass, you know, if that's acceptable to the commission. Yeah, and then my other comment was um, where there has been some dumping in the past through there, nothing too significant, but uh, it would be worthwhile acquiring a PIB in some boundary there. Just the, the placards, Matt, is that what you're thinking? Yeah, just, uh, just something so folks know that there is a resource area back there and they should be respecting it. Yeah, so I, I think, Mr. Hunt, you've um, had to, you put that in at your other property, just the placards um, that we have that identify the um, area in the back as the resource area so that, you know, the occupants of the apartment and, you know, future property owners know that it is a resource area and they won't be you know, building things back there or, you know, dumping waste, that type of thing? Yep. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay. All right. So let me open it up to uh, questions or comments from the commission. Melissa, did you have any comments? Um, I just have a quick question about the, the riprap that's there. Is that serving a purpose? Like, is that there because water comes down the driveway and needs to be dissipated and therefore should remain? No, or, it it was there, so when you when you pull out of that back garage door, you don't sink. The, oh, the okay. ball, that's all it was there for. Okay, so the garage door won't be there anymore, so there's really no purpose for it. Correct. Okay, gotcha. That's it. Okay, thank you. Jim, did you have any comments, questions? Uh, I do not. Uh, Mr. Harrow? Got to unmute myself. Can we go back to the drawing, please? Anna, just by, uh, for the record, Carrie just joined the meeting. She's probably in the waiting room for a little while. I just said, okay, thank um, you. I, I guess I'm okay. The, the deck, maybe I want a little bit more understanding about how the deck is going to be done. Okay, um, so it would just come out to like a 10 by 10 platform outside the door and uh, stairs straight down. So is it going to be on footings? Uh, on the helical uh, piles that the guys come out and drill in, you know, so that there, there wouldn't be footings, it would be that the metal pole that they screw into the ground. Okay, I guess that's it for me. Okay, thank you, Ms. LeBlanc. No questions. Uh, Mr. Barker Hook. No questions, no comments. Okay, are there any questions or comments from the public? If you can raise your hand. And I'll just go through it and see if we have any. Okay, it doesn't look like we have any questions or comments from the public. So um, if I can get a motion to approve or to issue a negative determination for the request for determination. I'll make the motion. Jim. Melissa. I'll second it. Jim will second. Okay, so Melissa made the motion, Jim seconded, and I'll go through the roll call. Uh, Melissa. In favor, aye. Carrie. Uh, let me just abstain because I missed. Okay. Jim? Aye. Ed? Aye. Janine? Aye. Ted? Aye. And it's an aye for the chair. Okay, Mr. Hunt, we're all set. Thank all you right. very much. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. Yep. Okay. We're moving along. Um... Mr. Petrosi, I don't think I've seen him join yet. But Robert Truax is here on his behalf. Mr. Truax, okay. Um, I just got to unmute him. Mr. Truax, are you with us? I am. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thought Paul McManus was going to join us as well. Uh, let me see if he's here. 
Mr. McNeil. I'm here. I don't know if you can hear me. Yep, we can hear you. Okay, I didn't, I, I'm on. I didn't, I didn't see your name. You just did you enter a number in? I'm, I'm on. Uh, I'm on by by phone. I'm having. I'm having. Uh, for some reason, I can't log on. I just want to. Can I verify the password is one eight six zero two eight? Uh, it second. is. Okay. Yeah. For, for some reason, I'm. I'm Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Truax. So, uh, when you go on the uh, agenda and you click on the link to get on, right. it asks you for the yep. password. When you punch it in, it says it's the wrong password. I was able to just open up Zoom on my computer, punch in the ID, and then the password, and it worked. These guys are trying to get on the link. Mr. Petrosi's having the same issue, and he can't get on the meeting as well. Okay. So uh, it's something to do with the when you click on that link that's on the agenda, and then it comes up and asks you for a password. You, you punch it in the password, and it's saying the password's incorrect. So then I just opened up my own program. I have Zoom on my computer, opened it up, and I punched in the ID, and I was able to get on through that. Okay. Um, All right. I'm going to try the same. Yeah, why, don't you, why don't you try that, Mr. McManus? We'll give you a minute or two while you're trying to log in. Great. Yeah, when I set it up, Jeff, it, you know, I just copied and pasted all the stuff that yeah. we did last time. I was able to do it through the, the meeting ID, but not the link. So when, yeah. I put my own, when I opened it up and put the meeting ID in, and then the password, it worked fine. So these guys are trying to click on that link, the link to join, and then they're punching in the password and it's not working. Interesting, okay. Um, yeah, Don, for me, I just clicked it in the, I didn't click the one on the calendar, I did the one in the meeting posting on the, you know, the web meeting calendar. That's how I came in and I had no problems. Yeah, me I came neither, in through so. the web meeting calendar. Yeah. I didn't try from the agenda. Yeah, I didn't do it from the agenda. <laughs> Um, so is Mr. is Mr. Petrosi trying to get in now? He was, yeah. He's on, I have him on my phone at a conference, right? I have my speaker phone right now. Okay. We'll, we'll give him. A, we'll give uh, Mr. Petrosi and Mr. McManus a few minutes to try to log in here. Well, why don't you try calling in, Will? Do the call-in number. Or if you can get on the web meeting calendar, going that way. Did you, Lou, if you can get on the web meeting calendar and click from there, you can get on. Yeah, he's not Is there. that on the town website? Yes. You go on the town website what and was scroll the, all the way to the bottom. You see the web meeting calendar at the bottom. Tom, what was the password one more time, please? Um, it's on the agenda. One eight six zero two eight on the town website. Why don't you do the call in, Lou? So you're on the phone, and you can you just call that number that's on the agenda, and you'll get brought in. You won't be there face to face, but you'll be there verbally. You want to do that? Yeah, we'll, we'll give you another minute. If uh, you can't log in, we're just going to have to do it by phone call, Mr. McManus. Um, that's that's fine. Keep, don't don't hold up on my account. I got you know Rob Rob's on, and I'm and and I can I can hear just fine. Okay, um, so Mr. Truax, you just want to give us an update on sure. um, where you guys are at, please. Sure. Don, can you share the screen and put the plan up by any chance? Yeah, getting to that right now. <clears throat> if you could go to sheet, uh, what sheet am I on? Either four or supplemental A would work fine. Four, four of eight? Four is fine. You can do four. That's fine. Sheet four works. Okay. I'll see if I can bring everyone up to date where we left off the last time we had a meeting on this. <laughs> I think. If I'm not mistaken, the commission had seen the plan with the three lot layout with the three homes. And mm -hmm. I think the last plan that was submitted that we had a public hearing on, we showed a drainage system 
that was overflowing from the wetland to a small detention basin and routing out to Pleasant Street. So that got reviewed by Beta, and the comment was that we were going to increase flow to the Pleasant Street drainage system. And there's really no way of putting any drainage out to Pleasant Street from this site that doesn't increase flow to Pleasant Street. So with that, we went back and we revised the plan. And now we're keeping the drainage on site. We're bringing it into the, it's coming into the wetland a area from Leonard Street. We put a little, it's gonna be a treatment unit on that outlet pipe. There's supposed to be a storm scepter installed. And then we have an outlet structure on the far end of the isolated wetland. It's in front of the house for lot 2A. And then that gets routed underneath the driveway. So the driveways are acting as a berm between the two wetland areas. So there's a wetland area on lot 1A and 2A, and then there's a wetland area on lot 3A. And that gets piped under the driveways, goes into a grass swale, which goes down around along the wetland, not right into the wetland on the other side, to the rear of the house on lot 3, where we have a small catchment basement, which is only, it's only about a foot deep, foot and a half deep. And that really is providing a spreader trench outlet through that basin on the back of that house. So this drainage system, as you see, it goes through one wetland, gets routed into a grass swale, and then disperses out through a spreader trench. And that spreader trench is about 50 feet from the property line. This has been reviewed by Beta. We have a second review back that was dated March 31st, which you guys have those comments. Mm -hmm. And I believe there's only a couple minor comments left that are within those comments. One of them is just talking about adding some type of permanent structure on the spreader trench, which generally we just do through a granite curb type thing within the riprap. And that's pretty much it. What I thought was we haven't made any changes since then. We haven't updated based on these last comments. Um, we really want to get in front of the commission again, because these are just minor comments that could actually be dealt with through a, uh, just a condition that we revise the plan and update those few things. So, I think with that, uh, I'll leave it at that. So now you've, that's really where we're at at this point in time. So okay. I'll leave um, that for the questions and see where we go from there. Yes. Yeah, so Paul McManus is with us. Maybe yeah. Paul, if you, if you want to ask Paul, Mr. Chairman, there was a planting plan. Restoration yeah, if I can, if, uh, before, before we hear from Mr. McManus, I just need to read um, the public hearing notice for the uh, Zero Leonard Street filing, the right away. Yep. Let me get that out of the way before we proceed. Um, so the Hopkins and Conservation Commission will hold a public hearing on Tuesday, May 12, 2020 at 7 o'clock p.m. virtually online to hear all persons interested in request for determination of applicability filed by Wall Street Development Corp to widen and pave a portion of the existing right away and to install two driveways with associated site work. The location is zero Leonard Street, Assessor's Map E19, Block 52, Lot 0, a portion of Leonard's and a portion of the Leonard Street right away. Okay. Um, yeah, so just in response to, um, uh, thank you for the overview, by the way, Mr. Truax. So Beta did have a few comments. Um, you know, as you said, revise the level spreader to include the impermeable material. Um, SW5, provide drawdown device well in the West Basin. Um, there was a uh, recommend a condition that the town or an agent for the town observe the excavation of the infiltration basin prior to loam and seed to verify design assumptions. So I assume that uh, the applicant is amenable to that. Correct. Um, SW10, the, we just need to verify, um, beta needs to verify, presumably, I guess, with the DPW, um, that installing a sediment four bay at the outlet of the extended drain light at the southeast corner of the lot is acceptable. Um, we had another condition, SW15, that a final sign SWIP would be issued prior to construction. Um, so we assume that's amenable. Yes. 
um, update the ONM plan to include uh, the map showing the location of the system components, provide signatures of the owners on the operation and maintenance plan and provide an estimated oper operation and maintenance budget. Um, and then SW18 um, include a condition uh, for the illicit uh, discharge statement that's signed by the applicant. So again, those I think are fairly straightforward. Uh, Mr. McManus, did you have any comments on the uh, planting plan? Um, Mr. Chairman, if you uh, back to the under the uh, the RDA, um, I did propose a uh, planting plan. Um, it talks about um, specify, uh, specify trees and shrubs to be uh, to be right. on right. Yeah. berm. Uh, one tree per 300 square feet is 33 trees and one shrub per 50 square feet for a total of 200 uh, and then additional, <coughs> excuse me, additional seeding um, native seed mixes um, per, the, uh, per the spec. Okay, Matt, did you have any comments on that? I think, as I recall, I think you, that was acceptable. Matt Burrell. Sorry. Yeah, I'm here, sorry, I was muted. No problem. Um, yeah, I had no, no problems or issues with the planting plan. I think that looked fine. Um, did have a couple of questions on the plan and I'm not 100% sure I was looking at the most up-to-date plan. Uh, and these are more potentially procedural things, um, but I'll throw them out there and whoever wants to respond can. Um, so, the plan shows the revised wetland boundary that was agreed to in the field between me and Oxbow. Um, was the, were the buffer zone lines revised? I guess on this plan, it looks like they probably were. They were not. No, it doesn't look like they were. No, they don't look like they were. No, they were not. Okay, so that's one thing, but it kind of gets back to the question of which wetland boundary are we using here? Because if we're using the revised boundary, then we have some direct wetland impact. With the driveway there. Say that again, Will. So, you know, I, I think there'd been a discussion earlier about which which wetland line was sort of existing under the ORAD um, and that the filing had been made before the ORAD expired. So I, I guess I'm throwing it out there for discussion between the commission and the applicant as to which boundary should be used and shown on the plan um, with the appropriate buffer zones and everything. Okay, let me, this, let me see this is from the Paul McManus, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm fairly sure what I, I can guess what Lou is saying, which is that, um, you know, this was filed when the ORAD was still in effect. And, um, you know, the commission wanted the, you know, wanted the, the, the question answered, you know, what's, is there any difference, you know, has anything happened out there in the interim? Um, but that, you know, kind of from a legal procedural standpoint, that his position, I believe, is that the, uh, the, the the filing was made while the ORAD was still in effect, and and that that uh, that that line that ORAG line should be the the prevailing boundary. Okay. Um, so having said that, you that in, we'll, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Let me just add one thing to that. So we do show the the new line on the plan. We don't show the buffers to that line. And as you can see, the driveway going to lot two a there's like a triangular area right there that comes into that right. line. Yeah. So with that being said, we're not opposed to providing replication for that area that's going to be filled with that driveway on that new line somewhere on the site. Ideally, I guess we could do it on lot 1A in that low area in front of that house. But I mean, Paul could provide some planting as some guiding on 
guidance on that. So we're not opposed to, to doing something to help that out. Even okay. though that line was not the line that was there when we submitted the plan. With that, yeah, those, those, that in mind. Excuse yeah. me, I was just gonna say the logical place to do that would be near flags, I think A26, A27 in that, in that general area. Okay. Through I guess the other, the other alternative that you can consider is, um, you know, one of the comments that we made to Mr. Petrosi, um, you know, there's two driveways here. And the commission um, just recently within the past few months um, approved a common driveway for a similar situation to this that was um, approved by both the planning board and zoning. So, um, you know, that was something we asked the applicant to explore uh, based on the email that we got from Mr. Petrosi. I believe it was yesterday. He is planning on doing that in the next few days. So he hasn't yet done it. Um, but I guess as an alternative to um, replicating that area um, where the driveway is uh, impacting the new section of the wetland that's coming out. Um, if the uh, shared driveway or the common driveway was approved, you might be able to uh, avoid that section altogether and kind of circumvent it potentially. So that's the other option that I would throw out there. And I'll, okay. um, and I'll, I'll open this up at this point to the other um, commission right. members to uh, make their comments or ask questions. I have a comment uh, through the chair. This is Janine. Um, so I know the, the, the previous plan with the way the drainage was going to work made an improvement to the stormwater runoff in the area, um, which sort of made me, in my mind, made me feel better about having houses in the buffer zone because overall the project was improving the stormwater runoff that's a problem in the area. Does this new plan with the holding uh, area in the back of the grass whales, does that also improve the stormwater runoff of the neighborhood or is this just taking care of stormwater on the property? Rob, you want to feel that? I, I, I know that the, that the, yeah. this is Paul McManus, I, uh, that the, um, the road, uh, the, the road has, has been designed improvements to the road because it's it's basically improving the existing road coming down uh, Leonard Street and that has been designed um, to to grade across toward the site um, and 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 make ensure that it doesn't uh, it doesn't block the the drainage from the houses on the south side which would be the bottom side of this of this figure um, which I know is an issue uh, for those residents there so, so the intent, Rob can probably speak better to it, but I know that was the intent. Um, the, the profile, um, if you look at the profile for the, the proposed road, um, it's clear that that, uh, that, that was uh, an intent of the design. Well, yeah. All right, uh, Mr. Chairman, Rob Truax. Yes. Um, just to add to that, so this plan obviously isn't gonna provide, you know, what the other one did, taking all the water from this area and putting it to Pleasant Come down. So, but what it does do um, is it controls the water that's going on to the site and puts it into a swale, puts it into a spread of trench, whereas before it's just dispersing everywhere and flooding people's backyards, especially those that are on the other side of Buckland Street. Um, this will definitely provide relief to that. We're not gonna get the spillage it's going in many different directions when it comes out of these wet that first wetland. Um, the majority of the flow that comes onto this site is coming out of that culvert and Leonard Street, as we all know. That seems to be the, uh, the, the, the main source of runoff coming into the and feeding this upper wetland, I guess I would call it the first isolated wetland. And then that disperses towards, you know, and it just, and it overflows in different areas if you go out there during a rainfall event. It's not just any concentrated area. So we are controlling that, we're mitigating that, we're slowing that down. We're, we're providing mitigation. That low area of the wetland that's towards the houses we're proposing, that's going to provide mitigation. 
we got the grass swale on the other side that's going to slow it down as well and then we're going to put it through another small basin which is a shallow basin which is going to hold some water and infiltrate um, and then spill out over a spread of trench nothing i mean all these basins that we're showing what are we doing we're not we're not digging them into the ground so we're not we're not putting them into groundwater we're keeping everything above grade we're just building basically berms and holding the water back so I, I do think it's an improvement to the area, yes. That's my opinion. Okay, thank you, Mr. Truax. Um, any other comments, questions Mr. from Chair, the commission? Uh, yes, Mr. Parker Hook. Um, I, I'm trying to go back and forth between the drawing in front of me and Ellie's comments. Um, uh, Matt's comments are dated February. Do they apply to the plan we're looking at? That's my first question. I'm guessing not, Ted. So what I'm especially interested in, Matt, and maybe it still applies, is your comment number four about the Eastern uh, IBW and whether we're taking, and I think that maybe, and maybe I misunderstood, that Melissa mentioned, not Melissa, um, Carrie, months ago that we're taking a wetland and turning it into a detention basin. Is that still an assessment that applies here? And if it is, could someone help me think through what that could mean? The, the wetland right now receives the water. Um, it, it flows uh, across the site from the, thanks Don, uh, from the, the eastern, the right hand IVW makes its way ultimately to, uh, to the left on this plan, to the west. Um, what's proposed will during, um, during large storm events hold back uh, some additional water. Um, there's, no new, um, there's no new roadways um, going into it. So it's, it's still, as Rob said, most of the water going in is, is from that existing drain down in that <coughs> corner. Um, so the, the, by, by adding the berm that, that Rob described, um, the water would be slowed down within that IVW. Um, the area might in fact get um, a little bit wetter. Um, there might be a, a shift in the vegetation uh, towards a wetter plant community um, within the wetland. Um, so there, there, could be, there could be a bit of a shift um, in there. Um, as I said, from, you know, over time from some, you know, more facultative species who pick up more of the, the obligates and, and, and that sort of thing. So if I may, Matt, the end of point number four in your letter, is that still something you'd recommend based on what was just described? Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those where if this were a bordering vegetated wetland, um, I think Paul would probably agree that this probably wouldn't even be proposed because it's pretty clearly forbidden in the stormwater standards. Um, this being locally regulated, the commission has a lot more um, leeway to allow this. Um, but as Paul mentioned, as and I think there's probably a, a fairly good likelihood that the vegetation community is going to change, um, you know, and that's somewhat in the eye of the beholder as to whether that's neutral, good, or bad. Um, you know, there's a chance that if, if the water is held back enough, or if, you know, in the future there's other development in the area that, that sends water in that direction, um, you know, the, the trees in there could could die off and it be, could, could become more marshy over time. Um, but it's really, you know, some might, might argue, well, a marsh would provide more diversity, you know, but um, it's, kind of, it's kind of a difficult uh, decision to make other than if the, I think my point and my comment was, you know, if, if the commission wanted more information with some sort of opinion from the applicant as to really what was going to happen and then whether the commission wanted to condition 
something in an approval that, that there was some expectation of what would happen in the future. And if something happened differently, you know, what would the ramifications of that be? I mean, I, I would just comment that, that um, you know, I, I, I think I agree with uh, it, certainly at least most, if not all, of what, what Matt just said. Um, but in terms of, you know, in terms of what's there now, you have a, you know, you have a, a red maple, uh, red maple and, and white pine canopy. Um, you're going to get, uh, you know, the area will, will hold back some more water. We'll get a shift. I don't think really it would be enough of a change to, to go all the way to a marsh community. I think you'd probably end up with, um, with, you know, probably a, a more dominance by younger red maples, the bigger ones, and the tip when they get uh, when they get too big, you know that's where you get your your wetland, your swamp pit and mound topography, um, and you'd get a little bit more canopy opening and and a denser understory. You'd you'd move, I think, I think more towards a shrub swamp community. Um, you know, our red maple swamp is is the most common wetland that we have. Um, I think there would be, it is reasonable to conclude that, um, that, that this would not be a negative impact and that, and that it would be a, a positive one because as Matt said, you'd get, you know, some, some heterogeneity uh, in the wetland rather than the, the kind of, you know, typical, typical uniform red maple swamp community that we have um, in, in so much of our wetland. Yeah, so to, to that point, Mr. McManus, um, you know, and just echoing what, what Matt had said, you know, this is uh, uh, regulated locally under the bylaw. It's not regulated under the Wetlands Protection, the, the Mass Wetlands Protection Act. Um, but, you know, from my standpoint, um, you know, I hear what you're saying. It's your opinion that wetland functions and values will be enhanced based on, uh, you know, what's being proposed. But I think if you can put um, a statement together for the commission um, so that we have that for the project file. You know, just basically re reiterating what you uh, just kind of walked us through, um, you know, and, and how, in, in your opinion, um, the, uh, you know, the wetland will be enhanced. That makes sense? <laughs> That, that's fine. I'm happy to do that and, and do it uh, probably a little more eloquently than I just did. Okay. All right. Great. Through the chair. Yes, Matt. Um, I don't know if there if their calculations have been run as far as or could be run as far as what the predicted changes in water elevation might be. Um, that could be part of that discussion. I, I presume that um, Paul would need some indication of that to to kind of make that call on what you know what the expectation is for the change in, in community if there is any yeah no that's fine i have i have actually discussed this with uh with rob truax and and i'll i'll reconvene with him and and uh re, you know freshen up those notes and include include that um because that that that's a that's a very valid point matt um and that that you know that information does does form you know the basis for my my opinion so that's that's perfectly reasonable and then one, one other point uh getting back to the um potential common driveway and avoiding or not avoiding that wetland impact um if the wetland impact can't be avoided um i don't in my opinion that area is so flat that it wouldn't make sense like if you're doing mitigation I think it'll be more enhancement plantings as opposed to doing any kind of excavation or cutting of trees or anything. I don't think it would be, it would make sense to, you know, cut down a big pine tree to replace it with a inch diameter red maple to call your mitigation. I think to me, um, again, getting back to, to Paul's point that if, if this, so the prediction is, is that this may open up in the future you know, maybe doing some plantings within the wetland, um, native plantings within the wetland that might, you know, do better um, and potentially try and outcompete some of the invasives that are in there um, might be the best mitigation as opposed to sort of doing a traditional, um, 
you know, dig it out and plant it type situation. Well, uh, that's, that's, uh, again, a good thought. We'll, uh, we'll look into that and, and, uh, and probably, probably come back with, with a proposal in that regard. Okay, great. Think about uh, it a little more. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions or comments from the commission? Um, I have a question, Jeff. This is Melissa. Yep. I guess, I guess two things. One, um, do we have, um, PIB, I don't see a PIB shown on the plan or um, anything like that. Um, also, I was wondering if the, it looks like, um, are these basement, are these buildings gonna have basements and are we expecting some pumps or any pumping of groundwater being that the groundwater so high? The wetland right there. If I may, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Truax. So all the basements are set. We said they're all walkout basements. So we have the cell floors just above grade, slightly about a foot, if you look okay. at them. So like um, the back of the building is the cell floor is 505, the, the rear elevation is 504 on building number 2A. And that goes for all of them, like the one on lot. 3A, the cell floor is 504, the grade right behind the building is 503. So none of them are sunk in the ground. I'm not okay. sure, what is a PIB, Melissa? Um, something we look for is just a, if it, um, putting a, something to demarcate the, the wetland and the limit of work for the future oh. homeowners. All oh, permanent markers, okay. I didn't know what you meant, the initials. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> permanent and movable barrier, yep. Okay, all right. We haven't shown any of those. Okay. Yeah, so the ex the expectation would be that we would want that. So if you guys can add that to the plan. And sure. Okay. So I'm assuming those would go where? On the top of the slope, probably around where the fillings to something along the top so no one dumps over the edge? Yeah, typically it's at the limit of work where you're putting your right. erosion tools. Well, I wouldn't do it at the limit, Don, because that's at the bottom of the slope. I think I'd put them at the top of the slope, no? Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah, I mean, because like over there with my wheelbarrow and I see him down the bottom, I'm going to fill him over. I'm not going to see him. Right. <clears throat> we'll, we'll come up with some uh, demarcation for him somewhere along that slope. Yeah. I'm thinking along the top up there. Yep. Yeah. It might, it might even make sense to put like a, you know, a split fence. rail <laughs> fence up along the top of the slope and then have the, uh, medallions that indicate that the area beyond the split rail fence is resource. That way there just prevents people from, you know, venturing down into the. Yeah, we can look into that. Okay, great. Thank you. We'll come up with some ideas if that's, you know, if it's not a fence, it'll be something. Okay. Uh, any other comments, questions from the commission members? That's Jim. Nope. Okay, do we have any comments or questions from the audience? Let me just go through, see if I have any hands. I don't see any hands. If, uh, if there are questions, you can speak up now. Okay, um, so I think you guys have your marching orders and uh, um, a plan for us. Um, Mr. Petrosi is going to look into the shared driveway. Mr. McManus, um, you have some additional work you need to do for us. Um, so we'll continue this out. Don. Um, Hello. What's that, Don? Sorry. Hello. Uh, my name is Tom Saunders. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, Mr. Saunders. You had a comment? I'm representing my wife who couldn't be here. Uh, okay, what, what's your, excuse me, Mr. Saunders, what's your address, please? Uh, 7 Crestwick Drive in Hockington. Okay. Yep, go ahead. Anyway, one, the, the main thing that uh, we were still a little concerned about was that going back, uh, you know, several months, uh, she had commented about this before, about a increasing level over the past few years of basement 
flooding at 12 Maple Street, which is the house that we're talking about here in this case, to be clear. Uh, Maple Street extension. The one right at the, you might say, is in the most harm's way from any flows of water that are coming through this area. And so we were just concerned of whether, you know, the, when we finally understood that a lot of this water was actually coming from that upper uh, east corner of the property uh, and causing a lot, a lot more water flow, we were concerned that does this plan really, let's say, slow down enough water so that May 12 Maple Street extension does not get worse or hopefully gets better in this case because it did get worse over time because of this other flow that was added a couple of years ago, three years ago, whenever it was. So that was my comment was there, you know, as the people feel good about the fact that it's not going to cause more harm to 12 Maple Street extension with this because the plan has changed quite a bit. I do like, we do like most of the plan but that question still kind of hangs over our heads, to be honest. Okay, Mr. Truax, do you want to uh, just respond to that? Or Mr. McManus? I'm trying to place number 12. I don't know where it is. Is that the one? That is we that right here? Is it's that 12 the right there, Don, at the end? West, the west corner. Yeah. That's right it. there. Oh, okay. So, I think of the of the swale, I guess. Yes. So right now, the, a lot of the flow goes actually into the front of your house. It'll it'll come across Buckland and get to your front area and and give you know it's it's, it's going to create flow towards you. It flows out towards Maple Street Extension. This flow is going to get diverted down through the existing Buckland Street. Well, it looks like what used to be an old easement. It, it actually ends at our property. And the flow continues down in that direction to the, I guess that would be to the south of your house. I will tell you that the groundwater in the area is not going to be reduced. Um, I don't think it's going to be increased either, but it's not going to be reduced. I mean, I've been on your site. I've seen the groundwater. I mean, we dug a hole. It was about two feet below the surface. We had groundwater right in front of your house. And I know you have a sump pump and all that some issues with your septic system probably even, it's probably in the back, but that's not gonna get better. I'm, I, I would hate, I would never tell you that's gonna get better. Um, maybe the Pleasant Street plan would have made it slightly better because we'd be taking all the water that even comes down in this direction, away from this direction. But that's, that's, not, yeah, that's not the situation anymore. I do think this plan is better than what's going on out there and it's gonna control water and it's gonna control flow. So it's not gonna be dispersed, as I said earlier, all over. Um, we are gonna retain some of it. It's gonna get held back. It's gonna get infiltrated in and around the site rather than just going off through the woods and not infiltrating. So I do think it's a better plan from what's out there today and because we're able to control it. Okay. Is there, is there any plan for the future to, to get rid of the water? that's being added to this and some other way I understood you don't have the capacity in the Pleasant Street uh, system, but what about other options for the future if this turns out to be bad? Yeah, I think, I think the only next option would be, be is to would someone would pipe this all the way down Leonard Street down to the old railroad bed to the wetland on the other side. And that's where all this water eventually goes. Yeah. There's a little, because there's isn't there a little ditch stream on the other side to the north side of your house that picks up water and goes on, comes under Maple Street extension from behind those houses. And then that, all that water goes down. I know there's been some work done behind your house as well. There's been some improvements back there. But all that water goes, everything goes that direction towards that, that old railroad bed down the back. So I mean, unless someone 
you know, if, if Mr. Terry decided to develop his land and maybe he would pipe water down because, you know, he's going to have, he has some high groundwater on his site as well. So that, that's the only thing I can think of. Okay. Thank you for the response. Yeah, so I guess I think what Mr. Sa what Mr. Saunders is, um, you know, uh, secondarily asking is just to make sure that, you know, the site development isn't going to exacerbate the situation um, that's out there now. Correct. Yeah, it's probably about the most we can hope for, I guess, at the moment. Through the chair. Yes. Don, could you put up the uh, the plan again? Not the photo. So I'm no hydrologist, um, but if the water enters the eastern new basin, the old wetland, but now it's a basin, and goes to the western one, it looks to me like all of the contour lines draw a straight line to Mr. to the house there at Maple Street Extension. Whereas the situation now, the water would be spread across Buckland Street, some of it going to that house, some not. So I, I think it's a valid question whether things would get worse for Maple, 12 Maple Street Extension. I'm not a hydrologist, I'm a high school history teacher, but that's what the contour lines are telling me, that water is gonna leave the Eastern Basin into the Western Basin and then follow the contours right to 12 Maple Extension. So we are controlling the water through that through that grass well towards towards the uh, Maple Street extension. You're correct. I did, and I could, and I could make a little improvement to where that basin. The I guess that would be the what is that westerly basin? That one there that Don's highlighting. Mm -hmm. I tried to keep all of that work out of your 50 foot as much out of the 50 foot and 35 foot buffers as I could. I could. Return. I could if, if I swiveled that towards the wetland and just tweaked it in that direction and brought the outlet that whole riprap area over like 15 or 20 feet, it would direct it more away from their property. If you follow me, as you would say, Ted, you you know just just from a common sense practical standpoint, I can't like grab it. But if I just twisted that basin, just just per turn it and. and Swivel it so I can so do that. So shift it, shift it down southerly, or just a little bit southerly. Yeah. So I would rotate it towards the south. So that berm where the riprap is would be more perpendicular to that westerly property line. I guess I would say, right? Tw twist it in that direction. I would pull it closer to the wetland a little bit. Doing that. Any reason we couldn't do that? I. I don't see a reason it would be the commissions if you know that's just more work in the buffer than and you know obviously I was just trying to keep as much work out of the buffer as possible. Well right and that's the trade-off isn't it we might be able right. to protect the property owner's property better but the commission's job is to protect the wetlands too. Yeah and I think the other the other the other thing that we need to be uh, conscious of as well is that's going to divert the water more towards Mr. Terry's property. So he, you know, may or may not be amenable to that. Yeah, a lot of the water goes to Mr. Terry's property now without any kind of controls. If you walk down there on a rainy day. So, right. and I did, and I am keeping it back away from the property line, as you notice, I'm about 50 feet back. So I, I don't have the spread of trench you know, right up on their property. So it, it gives it a chance to disperse as it would naturally do. That's the idea of a spread of trench also. How about extending that basin a little bit farther to the west, Mr. Truox, is that? Um, you can push it down a little more towards the prop our property line between Mr. Terry and us? Yeah. It could. Why, do you, why would you do that though? What you thinking? I'm thinking that would, I I'm just think thinking it, it, you know, it keeps the water from, you know, more in kind of a westerly direction. Um, I mean, maybe not. Yeah, I could do that. 
When the grades go that way. They all go that way. I mean, I, I would, we're not going to solve it tonight. I would take a look at it. See what, I'll see what I can do. Yeah, we can come up with some ideas for that for sure. Okay. Okay. Um, does that sound okay, Mr. Saunders? That sounds better. Anything you could do to tweak that and, you know, spread that water out or across, give everybody, give everybody an equal share of it as opposed to Maple Street extension getting, you know, 50% and everybody else gets 50. That would be helpful. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Truax will look at that. Uh, any other questions or comments from the public? Thank you for that. You're way. welcome. Okay, Don, so what are we looking at extending this out until the 9th? Your next meetings are uh, May 19th and May 26th right now, and then uh, we haven't, uh, we still have June 9th on the docket and the 23rd. I don't know if we're gonna, we haven't talked past the 26th. Yeah, I'm, I mean, realistically, I'm thinking that we're probably not gonna be able to get them on the May 19th next week. Right. So um, maybe May 26th. Okay. That's great. Just, just because of the backlog that we have, that's the only reason. Exactly. Okay, that's good Okay. All right. If you guys could, if you could follow up with an email um, for the continuation, that'd be fantastic. In the old days, we would just, hand you a piece of paper and you'd sign it, but. <laughs> Lou's gonna send you an email, Don. Awesome, thank you. Even though he's not here, he's listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great, gentlemen, thank you. All right, thank you very much. We'll talk, you. talk to you in two weeks and get some materials too before that. Okay, sounds good. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Have a good night. Okay, Don. Um, so that was, I think, the end of all the public hearings we had scheduled for, yep. for tonight. So I think now we'd be moving into a work session. Yeah, so let me, so work session item number one, let me just go through um, what we have here. So it's um, documented for the public meeting. Uh, so documents signed electronically and previously issued. Yep. We had Curdy 1 Greenwood Road signature page for the certificate of compliance. 20th Century Homes, 6 Leon's Way. That was an invalid certificate of compliance. Higgy, 30 Stony Brook Road, an extension permit for an order of conditions. Bias 33 Stony Brook Road, which was an extension permit for an order of conditions. Prime Properties, 34 Stony Brook Road, extension permit for an order of conditions. And the Sinisi Foundation, 36 Stony Brook Road, another extension permit for an order of conditions. Uh, and we have a couple documents for review, Don. Prime Properties, 21 Stony Brook Road. This is an extension permit for an order of conditions. Yep, you, um, this is the one you guys um, closed. Um, and approved for issuing a um, an extension permit. Okay. I think I've got it. Uh, documents to sign right here. Yep. So we wrote it up, and we can um, electronically have you guys sign it, and um, we'll we'll issue that. Okay, that sounds good. Thank you. And then we have another one for Coletti, Thirty One Stony Brook Road. And it's an extension permit for an order of conditions as well. Yep, that, you guys approved that at the last meeting and we're hoping to get this signed at uh, tonight's meeting. So we'll be able to put your electronic signatures in there and we'll issue it in due course. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay, new applications that have not been advertised to date. So we have Maspinock Woods LLC, 5 Elm Street, it's a notice of intent. 
uh, Nation, 6 Leon's Way, that's a notice of intent. Keeley, 60 Pine Island Road, that's a notice of intent. The Wolf, 28 Lumber Street, that's an abbreviated notice of resource area delineation. Bryant, 0 Downey Place, a notice of intent. And Vumbaka, 17 West Elm Street, this request for determination of applicability application. So what are we, are we looking at the ninth for those, Don? Well, um, we weren't, because I think we were still waiting to see, you know, after the 18th, uh, how the governor would go. Um, we're not sure if we can fit it in. Plus, we're hoping to knock off some of this stuff. So we don't know if we're looking at the 26th or, or June, because you still have that 45-day window after the emergency state of emergency is lifted. So, and we didn't want to put an ad in the newspaper and then not be able to hold the hearing and then have to run another ad and have right. them pay twice. So we wanted to, as we got closer and we got more of a understanding of what's actually gonna happen. So, okay. so we'll keep them in a holding pattern for now uh, yeah. until we figure out you know, how we're gonna proceed going forward with the right. uh, COVID issue. All right, why don't we jump down to Eversource, just because I think we have a few of the Eversource folks on the um, waiting to uh, for that discussion. So this is 55 Wilson Street. It's a violation discussion. Hi, Mr. Chair. This is Denise Bartone from Eversource. How are you? Can you hear Good, me? Good, Denise. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Um, I'd like to thank you um, very much for having us come tonight. I've brought some colleagues with me. Uh, we have Hans Van Lingen. He's also from our Eversource Environmental Department. Jim Blackburn, who is our LNG project manager. Kirk Hayden, manager of our Eversource LNG operations. Bruce Boucher, he's a supervisor for the Hopkinton LNG operations. Sean Lozier, he's our community relations, and Tracy Adamski, who is our consultant for um, our construction project. Okay, so, good evening, everyone. Yep, so, sorry, go ahead, Denise. So yes, yeah, so um, thank you very much for having us tonight um, and to provide us the opportunity to discuss what happened during a recent fire flow test at 52 Wilson Street. Um, that's the LNG facility, which is across um, from the main, from the tanks area. Um, that resulted in sediment reaching an intermittent stream that runs north of our site at 55 Wilson Street. And um, I wanted to uh, provide the commission some more um, description in more detail as to what had happened. And I'd like to toss that over to Jim Blackburn, if that's okay. Sure, absolutely. Okay, thank you. So, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I'm trying to do video, but it looks like it might not be working. So I'm not gonna hold things up to try to get that sorted out. But um, so the, uh, I'm gonna speak for the facility. I, I mean, I, I manage the, the projects at, the, at this facility and the other ones, but uh, um, we do, we did want to make sure that we had some of the folks that are part of the management group at the facility. So, um, Kirk is the, uh, the manager of all the, uh, Eversource LNG facilities in Massachusetts and in Connecticut. So we, we want to make sure that he was participating in this, uh, this meeting. We also have, um, the current plant manager, uh, Rich Alexiak on the, in the meeting. So, uh, Rick, uh, Rich is currently uh, managing the facility for us under the air products contract. Um, and then in the future here, and I'll talk maybe more about this later, but Eversource will be transitioning the operation of that facility from air products to, to our operation. Um, and so in the future, Rich, um, I believe will uh, continue to work with us as a, uh, in the supervisory role at the facility. And then we also have, uh, we'll be adding a second supervisor who we've already hired and is also on this call. Uh, Bruce Boucher, who um, is a former uh, chief operator at the plant, he's going to manage the uh, or supervise the plant operation. So we wanted to make sure that we had those three individuals on the call uh, to make sure that they had an awareness of this from the operation standpoint. 
uh, because I think this is our second event that was really related to operations and, and not really the project construction itself. So we definitely want to make sure that they understand the seriousness of this. Um, so I'll talk to, I guess, the event that took place. Um, I was on the call uh, or the meeting that was, I think you had two weeks ago. I wasn't able to uh, participate really, but I did listen in on it. So I, I do recognize some of the concerns that you had. So hopefully I'll touch on some of those. Um, so what took place that day, there, there was some fire pump testing that had been planned uh, by the operations group. Uh, we had a fire pump contractor on site to do some flow testing. Um, and so what they had done is set up a, uh, a manifold and they were testing both our diesel, uh, our diesel, uh, diesel engine driven fire pump and also our electric driven fire pump. Um, really it's kind of a 10 to 15 minute test, but it's a very high flow uh, test. So they, I think we're putting out about 2000 to 2500 GPMs of city water through that pump or each of those pumps uh, to test their performance after some maintenance that had just been done. So typically I think that's a annual activity um, we had done some maintenance earlier this year, so I think this was the second time this had been done in the last year. Um, so when that took place, what happened was some water was discharged. Uh, they typically discharge that in an area of the facility next to the fire pump house. It's a stoned area. I think it's all, you know, inch and a half stone spread in that area. We've never had issues with this in the past. However, um, I think there, was a, uh, there wasn't a recognition of the construction activities that were taking place, I'll say downhill of this. Um, and so as that water, especially at that volume, um, was flowed, it cascaded down, it went through the, um, the hay, uh, yeah, the straw waddles that were uh, separating the operating facility from the construction area. That then cascaded and I brought some silt down to the roadway where there's three catch basins, which, um, the water drained to, but those three catch basins also then drained back onto our west uh, side of the street property, um, followed down through um, around the LNG impoundment basin over to the um, outfall that we have um, at that uh, intermittent stream that goes down. So I had received the call from Chuck Cadlix, who's the director of municipal inspections that, after, uh, that afternoon. Um, I think, you know, because the project has so much connection to the different municipal uh, departments, I think I was probably at the top of that call list. So, so I received a call from Chuck expressing concern. Um, by the time I got off the call, I had already received a phone call from our environmental scientist who happened to be on site from Ty and Bond doing uh, an inspection of the, uh, of the stormwater system for the, uh, or the stormwater management uh, items for the project itself. Um, so she had noticed the amount of water coming down and there was silt carrying in it. So she had already had the project group start to mobilize some flo additional flock logs and, and see what they could do to try to uh, limit any silt getting down into that outfall area. Um, so when I got off the phone with her, I'd called the plant management group and, and kind of expressed our concerns and, and the fact that I had received a call. I think they had already been made aware by the DPW director or somebody from the DPW. And so Rich was already addressing it on his end. They had ceased operation of that. So I think it was a fairly short duration activity. Um, we did have, fortunately, some folks on site from the construction group who were able to uh, immediately react to that. But nonetheless, we, we did have, um, we did have the, the event take place. Um, I think uh, one thing I did note from your meeting last, uh, the, the last meeting here, and, and so we w wanted to be proactive on this. I mean, we, we certainly take this uh, very seriously. Um, and so we wanna make sure um, that we adequately address this for you. So uh, one of the things I did note from the last meeting was that you, you did feel that there was probably a benefit to having um, environmental scientists go out and survey that wetlands area. So we did take it upon ourselves to have Tyne Bond go out and perform that. So I, I think that was probably provided as part of some of the documents that Denise had sent over to Don this afternoon. So Don, I, I probably haven't had an opportunity to really circulate that, but we did provide that. Um, I think the summary of that is, is overall, I don't think there was any um, impacts to that wetland, at least not uh, uh, anything uh, of substance for the for the long term. So we wanted to make sure that we provided that. Um, and, and Jim, uh, Tracy 
uh, might be able to uh, expand on that. Yeah, so why don't we have Tracy maybe talk through that a little bit here. I don't need to do all the talk. Sure. Thanks, Jim. Um, and thanks, Commission. Uh, so we went out on site and we inspect the stream channel on the LNG facility um, at least on a weekly basis. Um, but we don't typically take a look further downstream. So uh, last week we went out and took a, a walk further down the stream, um, carried it about 600 feet downstream from Rafferty Road, Legacy Farm North, and then also um, looked at the stream where it crosses Kruger Road. And in those locations, um, we, you know, there was nothing unusual about the stream morphology. There was no um, sediment buildup that was, uh, you know, that showed any signs of impact from the fire flow discharge that had occurred. It all looked natural. Um, you know, we've been looking at the site for a few years now, and um, it was similar um, in nature to what we had seen previously. Okay. Um, thank you, Tracy. So, um, okay. I guess first off, you know, we appreciate, um, uh, Denise, you know, the responsiveness, um, for you guys, you know, fortunately Ty and Bond was out on the site, you know, the day this happened. So we were lucky in that respect. Uh, but we, you know, appreciate the responsiveness. Um, you know, you guys have been very forthcoming with the information um, and getting the information relayed to, you know, our commission in a timely manner. Um, so again, you know, we, you know, we, 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 uh, you know, we thank you for that um, part of this. I guess the, you know, from the commission standpoint, when we've talked about it is, you know, as you know, this is the third uh, incident we've had over the past 12 months out here. And although they're kind of different scenarios, you know, nonetheless, they're, you know, three different events where the commission had to be contacted and there were issues. Um, and, you know, as you know, with the, um, the new stormwater permit for the town, the town is responsible for any kind of illicit discharges that go to the storm, you know, the town storm, um, stormwater system. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to be, as a commission, um, you know, cognizant of that. Um, and I think, you know, what we're, what's going through our minds right now is, you know, is there a better way for um, the commission to be made aware, you know, prior to these events occurring, um, that they are going to be doing the testing so that we have at least an opportunity to maybe have our consultant go out, you know, to make sure that everything is um, looking okay in, towards, in terms of mitigation, um, you know, the, we'd have the potential to identify, you know, any concerns prior to the yeah. testing being done that we may have that we can raise with, you know, the plant uh, manager or the project manager, you know, those types of things. Um, so, you know, our initial thinking was, you know, maybe uh, do we put a notice or require a notice of intent, you know, that, um, uh, you know, puts in place a requirement where, you know, prior to any kind of testing that may impact buffer zones or resource areas um, or wetlands, you know, we need to be notified prior to the testing happening, or is there a more, um, you know, formal procedure that you folks can put in place um, so that we're made aware of the testing. Um, I guess, you know, we're kind of exploring different options. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I want to open it up first to the other commission members and then Denise, I'll let you and your team respond to, um, you know, maybe how you think you can, um, you know, suggestions you may have to, you know, make this more efficient and to prevent, you know, this type of stuff from happening in the future, I guess is, is you know, what I'm thinking. Absolutely. So first of all, um, are there any comments or questions from commission members? Uh, 
Uh, this is just this is Jim. Uh, I I agree, Jeff. That's a great idea. That there's got to be a way for them to notify us of these tests. Okay. Thanks, Jim. And Ed Harrow here, and I concur. All right. Anyone else? Yeah, okay. Melissa Ricas, I, I agree with, you, you gave a good summary, Jeff, of what we talked about, so. Um, agree. Okay, thank you. So, so Denise, um, I'll, you know, open it up to your team on, uh, you know, what your thoughts are. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Ed, sorry. I, I, oh, no, I'm just looking at Jim Cirillo, and he's standing on his head, and I find that curious. <laughs> Yeah, upside down. The coronavirus lockdown. All right, Denise, sorry. Um, no worries. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I, I believe that Eversource wants to work with the commission, absolutely. Um, I, as far as having, I, I think it would be a good opportunity for us to have more of a formal notification uh, to the commission uh, rather than something as in a permit. I'm not quite sure how NOI would really apply um, here as a, as the right vehicle. Um, however, I think um, we have committed to the town. Uh, we're not going anywhere. And I'm sure that we could work uh, with you to, to create a notification of any procedures that uh, would consist of certain flows. And I would like to hand this off to Jim Lockburn because he might be able to speak more to any other procedures that might take place that this could affect. Yeah, so um, we currently, uh, specific to this test, we currently already notify the fire department and the, DP, uh, the DPW, but really the water department um, mostly because of the, the volume of water that's used. Um, and obviously the, the fire department will want to give them an opportunity if they want to observe the test. I, I see no reason why the plant wouldn't uh, be willing to include that uh, a notification to say the uh, CONCOM uh, regarding the test. Now, I don't think there's weeks of notice. I think it's, you know, maybe a week or, or, or less, but I, I don't see an issue with us including some form of a notice uh, regarding the testing. It, it typically would be annually. I think, uh, again, this test was, I think was done uh, sooner than that because of some maintenance that was done. So I don't see that being an issue. I think beyond that, though, um, this is kind of highlighted to us. Um, we need to probably do more than just adjust a singular procedure. Um, and so holistically, we're going to review all the discharge potentials at the facility related to, to you know, similar type of activities that we do and, and see where that, uh, where that brings us and, and see if there's other procedures that could be updated. Um, and I think if it warrants in any of those procedures, I think this one's a little bit unique because of the volumes. I mean, we're talking, you know, probably 25,000 gallons of water that was uh, put, put to the ground in, in a matter of uh, minutes. Um, but I think if there's other large volume potential um, uh, potentials like this uh, where we could create, you know, impacts, I think, you know, we would be willing to make a notification to the ComCom uh, regarding that. So, you know, I, I don't see any issue with that. But I, I do think holistically at the facility, we, we do have some intentions of trying to make a, uh, a more comprehensive kind of guide for our operators to make sure that you know, they're more aware of this concern. Yeah, I think, I think that makes sense, Jim. Um, you know, of course, this needs to go a little bit deeper than just, you know, notifying the commission, you know, prior to a test or if there's an incident. Um, you know, there's the training at the facility that, um, you know, I think you could look at, um, you know, as you're, as, you're, you know, as you're referring to a more holistic approach um, so I guess, uh, yeah, why don't we let you guys kind of regroup and come up with a plan, um, you know, something that you can present to us uh, just so that we, you know, can get comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I think we can 
um, you know, if we need, if we need to, you know, we can regroup with you guys at a later point. Uh, you know, obviously this isn't, isn't going to get solved tonight. Um, but, you know, I would ask that you go back, take a look at it, the procedures, um, you know, what you guys are doing out there. Um, because we just don't want these types of incidents to, you know, continue to happen, obviously. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I may, yep. um, in addition to, uh, you know, right now, Air Products uh, is currently operating the plant on our behalf. Um, in the fall, and I believe Jim might be able to elaborate, but in the fall, Eversource is to take control of these operations. And I think that will also help with um, the, the compliance aspect and yes. the procedural, you know, we're not going anywhere. Yep. Uh, yep. So I think that's a, a key piece to uh, this um, issue. Yeah, I think that, that, I think you're right, Denise, that certainly will help because I know when we had the uh, fire retardant release mm -hmm. uh, a few months ago, it was, you know, I was going through all the different emails of people who had responded yeah. and, you know, it was just, it, it got very confusing. Right. And to your point, it would be very beneficially if, if we have, you know, ever source of one point of contact mm -hmm. who, you know, we're working with and And those gentlemen are here tonight. <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Um, okay, let me just, uh, let me open it up to public comments and questions. Um, we have someone here with their uh, hand raised and it's Katie. Um, so Katie, are you there? Katie, did you have a comment? It a might question? be muted. I see her moving her mouth, but I don't hear any sounds. There might be a muting. Katie? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. So Katie Towner, 9 Cougar Road. So um, uh, I had a couple of comments. First, to the most recent discharge. Um, that's an illegal discharge. Uh, High-velocity water is not a allowed stormwater discharge to the municipal system. And uh, I don't believe that Mr. Blackburn adequately explained how it could have gone anywhere else. You did not provide the path that it was supposed to go. So um, my conclusion is that it's always taken this path. And um, it's just the fact that nobody was there to report it. So when you're releasing 25,000 gallons of water in a short amount of time, um, we had this discussion in the, um, when you, about high velocity and the water releases through that stream and the impact it would have. And all of you people assured that there was no situation that that, that would ever happen. Meanwhile, you're doing it every year, okay? So I think that's, that's a uh, violation that should be uh, punished uh, because clearly you're doing it, you know you're doing it, and it's, it's, it's not an allowed discharge of, uh, to the storm drain. It's, it's not storm water, okay? My second, my second comment is to do with the um, release of the chemical release of the gallons and gallons of Ansel into the stream through not for the first time, this is like the fourth time um, that this has happened in the conduct of this test that you run twice a year. So um, last uh, summer it came up during the public hearings and you, you said you rewrote all your procedures and it could never happen again. Um, you had training and all of this and then it happened three months later. So um, I think that, that you don't deserve any consideration in terms of, uh, you know, doing what you say because, because you said you had all these procedures and training and yet, um, you know, you just went ahead and did it again. And um, even worse than it happened again, the worst thing in my mind, and I'm the one who reported it, it come right down a mile, it traveled a mile down the stream to my house, okay? Billows and billows of this foam. And the worst thing about it is when I reported it to the chief, okay? And when you guys came back, it had been doing that for three days. You guys, the incident happened on a Wednesday 
or a Thursday, and uh, you guys did not report it. And you you have a court order to report these things to 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 the town when they happen. And so the culture in this company is one of of not reporting incidents. Okay, so it was not reported, and then also you guys testified in in previous hearings that you don't pump the water out of that you don't pump water out of that containment area which is where all the ansel went which is always full of water because you have a groundwater problem okay that's been documented that that it's not just storm water you're pumping out of that containment it's groundwater so the pumping occurs very regularly and you all you ever source people testified that you never turn the pumps on unless you make an inspection that the water is clear and there's nothing there. Well, well, that's a lie. That's not true because, because you had this spill and then you automatically started your pumps and for three days you pumped this, this chemical into the streams which um, kills fish, it kills um, aquatic life, it kills, it kills dogs, it kills people's dogs. It's glycol, like antifreeze, okay? So, so your culture is one of not reporting, just, just these incidents happen, there's no reporting, and then when citizens like me write letters and say, hey, this is the third time it's happened, and why is this happening? You just make up these procedures that no one ever follows. So I think that all of these violations need... Um, need punishments and and i think the fact that the last time this happened um i asked that the town monitor all of these events because clearly you don't have any quality control of your own to monitor any of these things so i you know i think the town um inspectors should be monitoring all these things you should give advance notice and um you know, and and there, there is a lot of sediment in that stream that because you have a groundwater problem, you're constantly pumping out this, this containment basin is constantly filling, you're constantly pumping it out, and that whole um, length of Rafferty Road is always flooded. It's a mosquito hazard. You know, next thing we're going to be talking about is the Triple E, okay? You have no channel going from the pump you you have what two 200 gallon per minute pumps that you pump the water out to the rafferty road outfall you you have no um channel there's no riprap there's no nothing you just you just pump it out and it goes for hundreds of feet on both sides uh, of the pump and it's always flooded there and it's it's a health hazard and um i mean Okay, I think, I, think we, I think we got it, Ms. Towner. We, we appreciate it. Um, well, and it's so not the first time. It's not the first time. It's not the first have, time this dangerous that. chemical has been released in the environment, and it's concentrate. We so it's, a, it's gallons okay. and gallons of this pond. Thank you. Okay, so I think um, to Mrs. Towner's point, Denise, um, you know, this has happened several times. I think we need to get a handle on, you know, the, the type of testing and discharges that, that you folks are doing, um, you know, the frequency of it, you know, um, a notification to, you know, the commission so that we have the opportunity to go out um, to the site, you know, if we feel we need to, you know, prior to um, the work that's being done, you know, to do an inspection to make sure the appropriate controls are in place, those types mm -hmm. of things. Um, so again, you know, you guys are going to work on a plan um, that you're going to present to us. So, um, you know, we'll look forward to getting that from you and, um, you know, we'll just, uh, you know, we'll work on it from there. That sounds sure. okay. Mr. Chair, should we uh, also coordinate with Don to see what be, uh, um, I guess, amenable for his availability if we need to have him come out, what would be appropriate? 
Yes. Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, if you give us a week notice, um, you know, we have Matt that works with us as well. Okay. Um, you know, if Matt and Don are unavailable, you know, I certainly um, can, you know, potentially free myself up to be out at the site or I'm sure okay. someone else from the commission, you know, we can find someone to be out there. Certainly. Um, obviously Thank we you. would want Don or uh, Matt out there. They have more professional expertise than, you know, the, the commission does, but, um, you know, it, it would be helpful to, you know, have us uh, or have you guys provide notification to us so we can, uh, if we feel that it's necessary, you know, we can make, um, uh, um, we can arrange to have someone be at the site. Absolutely. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, let me just, any other comments from um, the public? I had one more comment. Yep, just quickly. Uh, okay, so when I see firefighting foam flowing past my house from an LNG plant, you know what I think? Maybe there's a fire, okay? And maybe I'm in danger. So the fact that, that they do not, when, when they spill this firefighting foam and they do not immediately report it to the fire chief, it's it's just egregious. It's it's you know, you know it's we live there, okay? I, 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 we I live there, that, and we valid. know what they do there. And yeah. when I see firefighting foam, you know, I should not have to tell the fire chief that. No, that make that makes sense, Miss Wall. I I I completely understand where you're coming from. Um, you're concerned that there might be a fire, or concerned that you may have to evacuate. The property or whatever um so you know again we're gonna um you know we're gonna work with other source you know we understand your concerns and um you know hopefully this will um you know we're gonna expedite the process in working with them and uh you know hopefully we'll be able to put a plan together that we can all agree on and uh we'll uh you know work for everyone going forward Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comments? Move okay. Um, so, uh, yes, Don. Sorry, go ahead. Um, yeah, some of the information um, that was submitted today, I was out in the field. I, I didn't get a chance to read all this. I didn't get a chance to really post it until, you know, a couple hours before the meeting. I can email the stuff out so to get the commission, you know, more up to speed on um, the information at hand. Yeah, and I know, yeah, that'd be great, Don. And I think that Ms. Fala had some questions um, as well that she submitted to the commission. Uh, we're working on putting those, uh, uh, gathering that information for her as well, right? Uh, who was that? I'm sorry. Uh, I think Ms. Fala had sent an email to us a few weeks ago requesting some information. You mean Ms. Towner? Oh, uh, Ms. Towner, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yep. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, I usually would respond to Miss Towner as, as quick as I can. It's yeah, I know. That, but, uh, but, but what I'm getting at is the the questions. there were some things that were outstanding that we're still working on pulling together for her with uh, Eversource. Well, yeah. And they did respond. These are uh, Eversource's, as you can see in the screen, she had had some questions for them and, and Eversource responded in blue to those. Oh, okay. All right. That's what I was referring to. Yeah. yeah but that, I, I think I just got this today. You know, okay. so, yep. I don't think you guys even saw it. No, it was, I didn't see that. Okay. Yeah, it was like an hour before the meeting. I was going crazy <laughs> just trying to download stuff. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, just just we... one last comment. I also um, followed up with the report that, that Eversource submitted. They have a um, twice yearly report they submit to FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Mm -hmm. And they, they neglected to report this incident about the foam. They characterized it as an on-site visit from Clean Harbors to clean up a small on-site spill. And they also reported one community nuisance complaint. So, so this, is, this is how they, I mean, it was not an on-site spill. It, was, it was, went up for a mile beyond the plant. So maybe they could respond to, to, to how they report these incidents 
up the chain. Why don't we, why don't we allow uh, Denise to just put that plan together, uh, Ms. Towner, and we'll, um, you know, we'll work on it from there, okay? Okay, Denise, thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you, you too. Okay. All right. Um, okay, Don. So I think we're at the draft minutes for review, February 25th, 2020. And any commission members have any questions or comments on those minutes? All right, if I can get a motion to approve the minutes, please. This is Melissa, I'll make the motion. And a second, please. This is Ed, I'll second. And we'll do the roll call, Melissa. Aye. Carrie. Aye. Jim. Aye. Ed. Aye. Janine. Aye. Ted. Aye. And this is Jeff and it's an aye. Okay. Okay, Mascaro, 22 Teresa Road. This is an exemption request on? Yes, let me uh, find that. I just um, posted this. Um, are you guys able to see my um, my memo here? Yep. Um, yeah, I just crank. I, I was able to do this like an hour before the meeting too. Um, if I can just sort of scroll through, so you've got um, long driveway and there's basically uh, a bunch of red maples. There's a wetland. You know, the, the lawn just ends right at right at the wetland. And as you scroll down, he had um, uh, arborists come out and take a look at some of these um, trees. So you got a, a clumping of trees here and they're looking to take out the, you know, they would prune this one and they'd like to take out these two upshoots right here uh, because how they are kind of growing over the, the driveway and, and the lawn area. Okay. And then, um, so you've got a, you've so got the a main, tree. The main uh, trunk there, they're gonna keep. This would, to... this would remain, yep. So you, yep. you got these, you know, coming up from the, uh, from the stump, you would have had uh, red maples tend to, you know, send up suckers. And um, the, um, so basically these are two suckers that are fairly, uh, you know, pretty good size. There was a six inch and a five inch sucker, but they'd prefer, you know, cause that's where these ones are really reaching for the light and, and um, problematic to the driveway and the, um, uh, and the lawn area. Right. And then you've got two trees here. You've got this tree that's got a broken crown and then this one's some, some disease looking, you know, I mean, some, um, some um, wounding here. And to me, it looks like the arborist was concerned with, uh, you got some um, root upheaval here. So that would be looking to take out um, a nine inch tree um, right there. And then there's a four and a half inch um, tree next to it that they're looking to take um, out because it's, it's got a broken crown. Um, right up through here, you got a you got a break, and you get a lot of suckering um, right underneath the uh, the crown. Okay. And then you've got um, live tree here with a dead, you know, second trunk. They just want to take out the uh, the dead trunk for the ongoing health of this tree here. You've got um, same kind of thing. You've got a, a a sucker coming out of the stump, and this 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 um, will kind of grows up and in front of that tree, sort of doing a lot of rubbing. So yes. I can see they want to keep the, the main trunk and this has just become problematic to the tree. Yeah, okay. Um, you've got a small tree here that's got a extreme curve that's going right over the, uh, the, the lawn area. So I think that was a concern that it's gonna keep reaching. Um, same kind of thing here. You've got a you've got a sucker with a broken crown on here. They they want to 
keep the health of this tree here and take that out. Mm -hmm. You can sort of see it's got a, um, a broken area right up in here. And then you get a, um, a clump of three trees right here. One, two, three, but it's, it's actually one tree growing out of the, out of the stump. The bigger one here is a 10 inch and halfway up, you've got a, it looks like a problematic area here. And there, um, the other two are growing, growing into each other. And, um, and then you've also got the, the big one growing over the lawn area close to the, close to the house. And then you get a large tree here that is growing over the house. And then these two trees here um, are growing over the house. And this actual trunk right here is, he basically, when I, was, when, when I met him, he goes, when there's snow on this, it actually touches the roof. And I believed it. Um, and then there's one last tree here that looks like it's got some root upheaval. So when you look at the, um, um, when you look at the whole, and it was so funny, this tree, which is a pine, they didn't even mock to, to take out, you know? So he was, he was being very selective on what he wanted to do. So basically you got the edge of the lawn and you've got the wetland and these are all red maples right along the, uh, the periphery. So there's, to me, it's like they, they weren't trying to go out and, you know, wholesale just cut everything, but. Yeah, I mean, it looks like it's a pretty densely um, yeah. forested area. Yeah, and all these ones on the edge are fighting for the light and right. they're just growing either over the lawn, over the house or over the driveway. Yeah, so I think once those are removed, I mean, it'll give the other trees more. Um, oh, yeah. You know, opportunity to grow out, right? I think so. Because everything else was, was, you know, the canopy. And these are the ones that tended to be under the canopy and were reaching for, uh, for the light. Right. Yeah. Okay. I think that makes sense. Is everyone okay with that? Yeah. Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Um, and it's an exemption request. So um, I guess we can vote on it. If I can get a motion to approve the exemption request for 22 Teresa Road. So moved, this Jim. And a second, please. Janine. I'll second, Melissa. Melissa, and we'll go through the roll call. Uh, Melissa. Aye. Carrie. Aye. Jim. Aye. Ed. Ed the tree hugger, aye. Janine. Aye. Ted. Aye. And Jeff's and I. Okay. All right. So Buonara. Yes. Um, six feet of Pecoro Drive. Restoration information received. Are you guys uh, able to see this um, Word document? That I'm opening. Not right yet. after. Hold on. I still see the agenda. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, let me see if I can find it. <laughs> that hurt. What the hell's going on here? Are you able to see the restoration plan? Uh, you got the the menu up. Um, I can see the planning plan um, in the menu, but it's not opening. It's not open yet. All right. There we go. It's opening now. Okay, good. So um, we got this on April 3rd. Um, well, Don, I you think know. you got to reshare again because you're going into a different type of document. Yeah, it's not open. I think because it's a Word document, there I probably should have tried to convert it into a yep. PDF. It's, okay, it came up right now, so we can see it. So you can see this? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So um, we had asked, to me, I haven't had a really chance to um, uh, go through all this, but it looked like, to me, it was just a reiteration of, of that. And then they've put this progress plan as an it's embedded in the you know, so basically I don't have a full size plan to look at the, you know they just they just emailed this this uh, word document and 
trying to think if they had, um, I don't know if I uh, downloaded the, uh, the email. Uh, yeah, here it is. So I'm not sure how well the commission, um, I don't know if you guys had a chance to um, um, look at this, but there was a lot. Uh... Yeah, I, I mean, I would say, Don, um, I, I didn't get a chance to look at it, actually, in, in detail. Uh, but what I would suggest is that, you know, you and Matt take a look at it. If it seems okay. reasonable to you, you know, re request the actual plan from them if you need it. Um, and then you and Matt can take a look at take a look at it and if it looks reasonable just you know have them go ahead and do the restoration i mean this is like we've been going back and forth with this for three years right oh my god yeah and so, uh you know let's let's move it along you know let's not yeah so when i when i quickly looked it over it seemed like they they didn't want to do the finalized plan it seems like they were um talking about how much money they've already put in and I don't know if we've got a finalized plan. I think they just want to see if the commission's okay with the progress, but I don't even have a decent one to look at. So I will um, um, touch base with Matt and just see if we, so we can um, give you guys a better sense. And I'll email this out to you guys individually so you guys can take a peek at it too and um, see what you think about it. But um, okay. yeah, I, can, I can table this to, um, uh, later till we get a chance to get caught up on it. Hey, Jeff? Yes. Yep. I don't know if it'll be worthwhile um, for either Don and I to, to go back out and actually look look at the site again to see, because like you said, it's been a couple of years. Not to say we want to let them off the hook for doing some sort of replanting, but I think having an idea of is it restoring on its own and to what level and or are they still doing stuff down in there might be worthwhile knowing. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense, Matt. If, uh, if you don't want to take a swing out there. Yep. Okay. Does that sound good, good to everyone? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a good idea to go take a look and be, I think that would be more telling than the plan, <laughs> progress plan. Yeah. Because yeah. the progress plan is June 2019 anyway. It's a year old. Right. I, I don't think they've given us the, and the key was um, we wanted to get the grade so we knew how much fill they put in to get it back down so we weren't losing um, floodplain. And um, that was, you know, and they'd have to stake out and, you know, so we'd know we're getting back down to the, um, uh, the grades. And I, I don't think they've given us a revised, I don't think that plan would suit what we were looking for. Yeah. Um... Okay. But me and Matt can go take a look in the in the field. Yeah, take a look, and we'll we'll uh, um, you know see see what it looks like now. Um, Miss Towner, did you have a question? No. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, Meyer Zero Franklin Road violation updates. Yeah, I just wanted um, at the last meeting. That was that uh, one on uh, Franklin Road where there was just like a, looked like a little gravel had been put in so they could get access. Oh, yeah. the, so yeah. uh, sent a letter, um, asked them to contact me and um, the property owners are down in Florida and she'd actually just drove up to bring the dog back and then she was driving back down and then they were coming back. But she goes, she thinks her son had done it and she wanted to coordinate with her son and she said, when she gets back up, she'll, um, you know, try and make whatever they need to do to make it right. So I just, sounds like they need a little more time to, you know, get caught up on that. Okay. So she, did she know why he did it or no? No, she, because she, she uh, basically brought the dog up, uh, looked at the mail, saw my letter, saw the telephone number, called me and said, I'm turning around and going back down to Florida, but I'll try and, um, talk to she goes it's it sounds like it's my son you know and i'll talk okay. to him and see what the heck's going on so she drove said, yeah, all the way up here for a dog and then turned around uh, and yeah can you believe that yeah yeah she drove the dog up you know wow. yeah and then was driving back down because the husband's still down there what kind of dog was it 
I don't know, but she didn't want it. I guess she didn't want it. Special one. And she wanted to bring the dog back. <laughs> wow. Dedicated. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we'll, we'll uh, table that until we get more information. Yep. Um, so we got the uh, environmental impact review for the mass DOT project. Um, and I think we just want to uh, have uh, you and Matt take a look at that and provide comments, Don. Okay. Does that sound uh, good to everyone? It's, yeah. Yeah. All right. And uh, were there any public forum requests? Um, I had, um, so, um, I was out in the field today and um, I need to put um, some pictures together, but um, the uh, Pulte site, Legacy Farms North, um, there was some erosion down into the, uh, the towns, the town's land that um, got donated along East, um, East Main Street. So I will, uh, I think after this meeting, I'll try and get all those photos together, email um, Pulte, and I'll probably copy the chair and the vice chair just to keep you guys up to speed on um, what's, going, what's going on out there. So that's the, um, all the houses they're putting in when you go up on Legacy Farms North, they're like up on the hill. There. Yeah, like th this would be right above where the Marathon Solar um, panels went yeah. in. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah. It, okay. there's, um, there's new development right, right above the uh, panels. And uh, from what I could tell, um, there, was a, there was a breach and it came down through the uh, intermittent stream channels and made it all the way down to East Main Street. Okay, did you go up there and look at it, Don? Yeah, I was out in the field today, so I took pictures because I get a report of um, some finds in that area, you know, along the road where they could see it. And, um, and then I basically just followed it all the way up. And obviously the, the sediments got thicker and thicker the closer I got to the uh, construction site. So I'll turn all my photos um, into a PDF and I'm gonna reach out to um, uh, the site super um, after this meeting and I'll uh, copy um, uh, Beta, because um, Beta's um, overseeing the site for, for planning board. Okay. Okay. Um, that sounds good, thank you. All right, we have a couple folks um, that are uh, in the meeting here. Were there any questions or comments? Mr. Dell, Mr. Fulbert? No. Uh, nope. Okay. All right. Well, I guess uh, if I can get a motion to adjourn the meeting. Oh, we didn't do the minutes. Did, did we want to approve the minutes? Did we? Yeah, we did. Oh, we did. Yeah. All right. Never mind. <laughs> I'll go back on you. <laughs> <laughs> you cannot. Uh, you can make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Okay, I'll you. do that. I'll make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> All right. And do we have a second? <laughs> Second, Ed Harrow. All right, Mr. Harrow, and we'll do the road call. So, Melissa? Aye. Carrie? Aye. Jim? Aye. Ed? Aye. Janine? Aye. Ted? Aye. And Jeff, and it's an aye. All right, everyone stay safe. Aye. All right. Thank you. you too. All right. Be well. Have a good evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Take care.